I owe my career success to three traits. The first is a love of strategy. The second is a bias for action. And the third is what friends and colleagues would describe as an approach to work that's calm, cool, and collected. In the early morning hours of June 14th of this year, all three of those traits would be tested like never before. While on a business retreat at a rented home straight out of Architectural Digest, I was brutally attacked by a drug-crazed intruder. I went to bed at 11 p.m. and at roughly 12.30 in the morning, the door opened up and I saw a flood of light from a hallway. I looked at a shadowy figure, a man, all I could process at 12.30 in the morning was that it must be one of the colleagues who was with me on this trip, because there were four in the house. So I thought, surely this is somebody pranking me. So I turned to the man, and I said, cut it out. That's not funny. And he replied in a cold, monotone voice, I'm not joking. I'm going to kill you. So I jumped on my bed with my feet, surely intimidating in my J. Crew snowflake boxer shorts and t-shirt. <laughs> and then he came around the bed. So I jumped to the floor and got myself in a ready position, ready for I don't know quite what, because I had no weapons. As he came around the bed, he began to poke at me. He poked and I danced. He jabbed, and I danced. He struck me on the upper chest, but the wounds were not severe. He then began to slash at me, and he slashed me on two sides of my face. I wasn't so fortunate. I looked at him, and I said, what the F are you doing? I think it was quite clear what he was doing. He was trying to kill me. He had already told me that. At that point, he raised his arm to the sky, and he hit me as hard as he could with all his drug-induced might with a knife sharpener that he held in one hand. I fell to the floor six feet below, and I was bleeding profusely out of my head into my eyes. And I had a do-or-die moment, as in do or die, right now or else. So I stood up. And I took the closest thing I had to a weapon, which was my forearm. I stuck my forearm out, and I charged my attacker. I hit him under the chin, and we both fell about eight feet into the adjoining master bathroom. I landed on his legs. I pinned him to the ground, and his legs were incapacitated. But the bad news was his torso and his arms were not. So again, he reached to the sky, this time with a carving knife, where he hit me in the calf, again, with all his drug-induced might. The pain was unlike anything I'd ever felt. He struck me pure. I later found out the knife snapped in half. At that point, I stood up, and I screamed for help with all my might. The good news was that a colleague had heard the thud on the bathroom when we landed in the bathroom, and he began to run. And so when I screamed for help, I heard the two most comforting words I've ever heard. I'm coming. And with that, I darted out of the room. Luckily, my attacker was on the other side of me, and I, op I went in the opposite direction. He was unable to stop me. We went down the stairs. I met my colleague outside the stairs. We went down the stairs, and my attacker chased us down the stairs. We fled outside a sliding glass window onto the patio. We ran up a set of stairs outside, and we fleed into the front of the home to a grove of tall pine trees, where we waited for two minutes, constantly thinking that the attacker would be right around the corner. At that point, my colleague said, we need to try to get to the other house to get help. So we escaped the woods. We went toward a dirt road, and he looked at me and he said, I need you to run because I'm afraid he's going to see us. So what did I do? I began to run. How I ran with my calf sliced in half, I have no idea. 
I made it up the hill. We got to the other home. It's now 12.45 in the morning, and we rang the doorbell, but nobody awoke. We went to the back of the house, banged on windows, nobody awoke. We went to the front of the house and banged and screamed until somebody awoke. I went to the home. They took a dish towel and a belt and created a tourniquet on my leg, raised my leg, we called 911, and within about 20 minutes, an ambulance was there. I was brought to the hospital where I was stabilized prior to surgery. And the good news is I've recovered fully. I wish this real life horror story on no one. No one should have to go through that. But I think there's some lessons to be learned in adversity, and I'd like to share them with you. The first is that relationships are everything. In the moments after my attack, as I was sitting in that hospital bed, I never thought of my four-bedroom house. I never thought of my supercharged Audi. I never thought of my titleless driver or any of my material possessions. I thought of my wife of 24 years. I thought of my kids. <laughs> I thought of all the loved ones that my overbooked life didn't allow me to spend time with. So my advice to you is this. Spend more time on your relationships. Find time where it doesn't exist. Go on more vacations with your families and loved ones. Hug your kids more. If you don't have kids, hug your dog. And if you don't have a dog, get one. <laughs> My second lesson relates to the human condition. And that is simply, there is always another gear. With my calf sliced in half and my head cut open, I darted out of a room, I flew down a set of stairs, I ran up a set of stairs, I ran into the woods, I ran onto a road, I ran 200 yards up to another home. There's no way that should have happened. When the police the next day interviewed me, they told me they saw every step I took for 300 yards. With a footprint, splat. Footprint, splat. All I can say is when you fight adversity, dig deep. And then, dig deeper. There is always another gear. My third lesson relates to business. I've been in business for 30 years, and I've been in very competitive business environments. And I can tell you that no matter what business you're in, it's always under attack by your competitors. If you look at the Fortune 500 from the year 2000, 52% of the companies listed then are no longer listed today. Why is that? Clearly, there are companies that are using technology and changing the game of how businesses get, get, get done. But beyond that, I would actually surmise that a lot of why big businesses are losing is because they're playing defense. If you look at it, Airbnb is now worth more than the combined Marriott and Starwood. Tesla is worth more than General Motors and all its brands. Why is that? It's because these brands that are starting up are not playing defense. They're actually on offense from day one, fueled by the power of disruption. If you think about what happened to me, the moment I went on offense was the moment I changed my fate. So my last lesson for you is stop thinking about the present. Think about the future. Stop playing defense and go on offense. It just might save your life.